I'm very excited to present today my PhD research. Uh, so as Armand mentioned, the title of my presentation is Selection and Population Histories Shape Global Allelic Expression. And so I wanted to begin this presentation by discussing forces of evolutionary change. So we have natural selection, genetic drift, mutation, and migration. Now I'm particularly interested in natural selection because it's been really important for many areas of research, including human genetics. It's been important to pinpoint functionally important regions of our genome, for the adaptation to different environments around the world, and for the frequency and intensity of many diseases. Now, natural selection has been very well characterized in our DNA, specifically when looking at coding regions of our genome. However, we're only beginning to understand the role of selection on gene expression variability. And this characterizes a whole new avenue of our genome, including looking at these regulatory regions. This is further going to enhance these aspects of human genetics that we've been studying, specifically looking at how evolution is shaping our regulatory genome. And so one way we can investigate how selection is impacting gene expression and genetic regulation is through a process known as allele-specific expression, or ASE. And this is where we have an unequal expression of an allele at a particular position. And this can be caused by a cis regulatory variant upstream. And so this example here I'm showing you with this variant is causing an overexpression of a damaging mutation. But depending on the haplotype this variant falls on, we could also get an underexpression of a damaging mutation. Now in 2018, a group with Castell et al. has showed us that selection removes haplotype combinations that overexpress a damaging mutation. So it shows this sort of protective mechanism of ASE with selection protecting from these highly deleterious mutations. Now, my question remains of how does this actually happen? We know that it's occurring and we know the overall action, but what in our genome is contributing to this? And this is where my research comes in and I'm investigating aspects of our genome that contribute to the efficiency of selection to see how it influences allele-specific expression. And the two that I'm presenting today are recombination and effective population size. So the data that I'm using is from Canadian's population cohort called CANPAP. We have a thousand individuals that have been genotyped in RNA sequence from whole blood. And they have ancestry from Africa, Europe, and three subpopulations, Quebec, Quebec City, Montreal, and Saguenay. I'm also using the Genotype Tissue Expression Project as an external validation. I'm not presenting the results of this today, but I have replicated all the findings in whole blood, muscle, brain, and ovarian tissue. And we do see quite consistent results across tissues. To go over the ASC pipeline, we start out with genotyping data. This is to identify heterozygous positions. Since we're looking for an imbalance of alleles, we need only positions that have two alleles, so the heterozygotes. And then we can look for those same positions in the RNA sequencing data to gain this uh, expression information. Next, we have to correct for mapping bias. This is a known and very important bias in RNA sequencing, especially when looking at allele-specific expression. And this is where the non-reference allele is going to have a lower probability of correctly mapping to the reference genome. So we might end up seeing this overexpression of the reference allele, but this may not actually be biological, instead just due to this bias. And so we're correcting for this using a method developed from our lab in 2016 by Alan Hodgkinson, where he simulates a 50-50 read ratio at every position and then maps those to the reference genome and identifies any deviations from this 50% ratio. And then using that same deviation per position can correct for it in the RNA sequencing data. And so once we've done this, we can then move on to test for ASE. And we do this using binomial tests. This tests for deviations from 50% using the read counts for each allele at the position. We can then correct for multiple testing and then finally, we use ancestral alignment to identify which allele at each position is the ancestral allele and which is the derived. The ancestral is found in chimpanzee, rhesus marquis, and human genomes, whereas the derived allele is only found in humans, so it's this newer mutation. And this is important for the directionality of ASE, because moving forward, I'm going to be referring to it as overexpression or underexpression relative to the derived allele. So to give you an idea of genome-wide ASC, I have tested approximately 3 million individual SNP pairs and found that about 6% have significant ASC. And of that 6%, it's quite equal in terms of those that overexpress or underexpress the derived allele. Now this result I'm showing is important for the overall actions of ASC, and it supports the research that I presented at the beginning by Castell et al. 
On the x-axis, I'm showing you how deleterious mutation is. This is measured by a CAD score, where a CAD score of 10 shows us the top 10% most deleterious mutations in the genome, of 20 is the top 1%, and the 30 is the top 0.1%. And on the y-axis, I'm showing you the derived allele proportion, where anything above 0.5 shows an overexpression of the derived allele, and anything below 0.5 is showing us an underexpression. And what this linear model is showing us is that at highly deleterious mutations in this bottom right corner, we're seeing that these are often underexpressed. So this is again showing this protective mechanism with ASE uh, underexpressing these highly deleterious mutations. And so this result is important because as I now introduce aspects of selection, I want to test to see if this action changes. The first aspect I'm talking about today is recombination. So we know that selection acts to increase beneficial mutations and decrease the frequency of damaging ones. However, what happens in situations like this where we have both on the same haplotype and they're linked? This is known as selective interference. So selection has to either increase both in the... So what we see here is that for both bins of significant ASC, whether it's derived underexpressed or overexpressed, we see that they're enriched in regions with high to normal recombination. And so this is supporting the thought that selection is influencing uh, ASC through recombination. To briefly remind you of this figure, we see that ASC is protecting from highly deleterious mutations, but I just want to mention that the slope of this line is going to tell us how efficient this action is. So a steeper slope is going to mean that they're more efficient at underexpressing highly deleterious mutations. When I split this by recombination, this is exactly what we see. So we see that higher rate, regions with higher recombinations, seen in orange here, have a steeper slope. They're more efficient at underexpressing these highly deleterious mutations compared to normal and lower combination. And a reminder that the high recombination regions are the, the regions which have more efficient selection. And so we can think of this in terms of this regulatory variance, where if we have a variant that's overexpressing a damaging mutation with recombination, this can break apart that linkage with that regulatory variant and allow for both haplotype combinations to exist. One where we're overexpressing the damaging a mutation and the other where we are underexpressing it. Therefore, selection can then act more efficiently to remove haplotype combinations that are overexpressing that damaging mutation. The next aspect that I want to talk about today is effective population size. This brings the concept of genetic drift into this conversation where small effective populations such as Saguenay are more susceptible to effects of genetic drift and therefore have less efficient selection compared to larger populations such as Africa. So if I show you this odds ratio once again, where we see that ASC is enriched in high to normal recombination, this time I've split it by population. So we see that Africa, the larger effective population, has an increase enrichment in these regions compared to Europe. When I then introduce Quebec City and Montreal, we see comparable uh, effects between these three populations, and this is consistent with their overlapping effective population size estimates. Finally, if I introduce our smallest effective population size of Saguenay, we see again this reduction where we see a weaker enrichment in these populations in these regions. So this is further supporting the idea that selection is impacting the actions of ASC through the effective population size. So just to summarize my presentation, presentation today, I've showed you that ASC is a useful tool to explore the effects of regulatory variants. And I specifically showed how I've used this to explore selection and how it impacts gene expression and regulatory variation. So I showed you that recombination and effective population size, two attributes that are important for the efficiency of selection, are impacting the action of ASC. Specifically, where we see that sites with higher selection efficiency are using ASC to protect from highly deleterious mutations. And this research is important for contributing to our understanding of how evolution is shaping our regulatory genome. And with that, I would like to finish off by thanking my lab. Thank you to my supervisor, Philip Awadala. My whole lab, including those highlighted, Mary Julie, Fabian, Dave, Isabel, and Hillary for their tremendous help on this research. And thanks again for inviting me here today. I'm really excited.